podcast. Today's guest is the owner of Mind Body Counseling and Coaching PLLC. She is a powerhouse in the field of personal development. Her global coaching program, The Image Shift, Three Secrets to Manifesting the Life of Your Dreams, helps individuals calm the chaos of the mind and gain clarity by activating the energy in the body. By elevating one's thoughts, words, and actions to take the quantum leap for success. Now known as a powerhouse in the field of personal development, she's known for igniting positive change, helping individuals create a culture of positivity, productivity, and optimizing potential. She has devoted her life to studying with the best in the field of change work. Our guest is a member of the Bob Proctor Coaching Program, international speaking speaker featured in PGI, which is the Pro- Proctor Gallagher Institute slash MSI community, and in the global community of executives, the Executive Networking Events, EME. And she's speaking on using your creative faculties to envision your goal. She has been featured in several podcasts, teaching on mindset and movement, and in publications and sharing how she thrives through cancer. I am proud and honored to present you our guest for today, Don Gaden. Sorry, that's Don Gaden, right? Don Gaden. Don Gaden, yes. Yeah, thank so, you. Hi, Don. How are you doing? I'm great. Doing great today. How about you? I'm I'm doing well. Uh, struggling speaking at the moment. It's just <laughs> my my mind's trying to um, I guess align with my 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 words <laughs> but yeah i'm doing awesome too super blessed and uh super thankful definitely grateful for what i have for today um yeah so like you know for yourself what is one thing you're most grateful for at this moment at this moment um being here probably many people say that right being here to talk to you of course yeah and it, i mean really it is because when i take a look at moments right looking Mm -hmm. back at what got me to this moment you Mm -hmm. know the work i'm doing waking up and going wow i can actually wake up every day and do what i love and the people i've been meeting and surrounding myself with has gotten me to this moment and so it's like really being able to be aware of that paying attention to it and say wow thank you like this is great thank you you know i was listening to a book i do a lot of books on audible right now and i remember one of the books I was reading, she was the woman was talking about how, you know, when we want to be entrepreneurs and we want to really do what we love, we squeeze it in, you know, before our daily job, at night, when the kids go to bed. And it hit me. It was like, I get to do what I love every day. Like, I'm already the, in the place where this is what I do full time because we get down, right? We get down, we get stuck. And so it's like, oh, okay. We have to remember those moments to be grateful for. Oh, yeah. What we're doing. And, it, you know, I find that per- personally, I feel that if you're able to do or if an individual is able to do what they love every day, um, I tr- you, there's that saying how like you're, you're technically it's not a job because you do what you love. Right. And I right. think um, I think that's one of the one of the check marks to living a fulfilled life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that's one of the quotes that sticks with me with Bob Proctor, that coaching program I'm in. You know, he says, we work for fulfillment. We yeah. work for fulfillment. We, and I can't remember the other part of the quote about making money. You know, we have to make money. He talks a lot about that as well. Mm-hmm. But we make money to have a lifestyle, something like that. But we work for fulfillment. I thought, yeah, yeah. That I believe that's why we should all be working. We all have that right and that ability to really enjoy what we do every day. We don't have to be miserable. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's as simple as just taking the, you know, deciding, right? Like deciding and actually taking action. Um, Even if no matter how small or how big the steps are, it's, it's Mm -hmm. about taking the first step, I believe. (laughs) Right. Yes. And choosing, making that choice of, wow, I can do this. Yeah. I talk about choice a lot with my clients and sometimes it's such a little decision, like a little, like I have the choice to go into this environment happy Mm-hmm. confident or fearful like oh i have that choice yeah yes, as simple as that like choice and how we show up you know and sometimes it's choice on where we show up sometimes we don't depending on the circumstance we don't have a choice where we're showing up mm-hmm. that's another story but then if we're gonna choose to show up there how yeah how show up? so choice is so big in everything yeah that's that's a hundred percent right there. I can't, I couldn't agree, agree with you even more, like anymore. And, uh, 
yeah if if anything else i think that's one of the biggest things i've learned or the biggest lessons that i've learned in my life is like you said the choice um um if you could be going through the worst time or what you think is the worst time in your life but again you know i'm sure you read the book victor frank uh master for meaning by victor frankel right that's i think that that book's a great example of choosing Mm -hmm. and making that choice Right. Because when we take a look at life, really, like for those who don't under, know about that book, um, you know, he was in the concentration camp. And if we, I think I, from my perspective, I look at today where I am today, that's like the worst experience to date. Right. Mm-hmm. So if he can choose his thoughts and how he experiences something from that experience, okay, you know, we can, you know, we, we don't even have that type of challenge. Yeah. So choice is so, you know, so important and we have the ability to do it with a very like less painful experiment. experiment. Mm-hmm. So what the, obviously this kind of stems to like, this relates to the mindset, right? So mm-hmm. in your perspective, um, how much do you think in our world today that we know about the mind from a scientific perspective? Because I feel that we're barely even scratching the surface when it comes to the scientific level because, you know, we're still trying to do studies of the mind, but there are really no real key measurements or tangible measurements from, let's say, um, a testing aspect, right? So, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very, I think it's part of the mystery of life. Yeah. You know, and I I think we we don't know. We don't know half of of what we what's possible yeah um and i know the the and i uh, i can't quote the the where this came from but um it's said that 95 percent of what we think feel and do comes from the subconscious mind mm. we run on automatic almost all of the time I believe and that. if we take a step when i say that to my clients they're like oh my gosh i'm like yeah breathtaking like more than the majority of our life we're on automatic just going through old ways the same thing over and over and and to to realize that the power of the subconscious mind is so strong those Mm -hmm. old patterns powerful that like how do we break out of that and there's there's ways right and that's why i'm studying with the experts i study with because they've done it they've seen it they've teach people how to do it it's possible the, you know, the science, the brain the research still is, is a lot of unanswered questions, but it's possible. And so just being able to know that and see it, it's like we have to keep moving toward in that direction. Yeah. Because we know, we don't have all the answers, but we know what's possible. We know we can get out of the subconscious mind. We know we can make conscious decisions for ourselves. Mm-hmm. It has to do with repetition and habit and practice. And then we can get to where we want to go. We don't always know how. And I think that's where that divine spirit comes in. You know, the piece that we don't can't touch and feel. Yeah. But we know it's there. Yeah. We know it's there. See, I love how you brought that or mentioned that because I was going to my like I was going to ask you like from a spirit like if we look at spirituality, like do you believe that has a big that ties in your spirit one spirituality? and one's mindset that do do you believe they go hand in hand or do you like what what is your take on that i i believe from my perspective spirituality is like it's a piece of us that we can't it's a piece of us just like our physical body is a piece our mental Mm -hmm. emotional like spirit is a piece of us yeah and it's really not mind body you know mental emotional physical there's spiritual there's like really four if we want to put a number on it yeah it matters. It matter. It's the intuition. It's the little whispers that we get when we know we're on the right track or the wrong track. It it matters. And all the the people I've studied yeah. come from a spiritual perspective. Mm-hmm. And they're successful and they're serving and they're giving and they're kind and compassionate people and successful. And so I think it's a key piece. Yeah. And I, the reason why that question just came up automatically is because for myself, I find that as I more, as I align myself more to my spiritual side, I find that 
I, I know this is so cliche and this is said all over, but like the universe really has its ways of, you know, paving the path or helping you, you know, determine or being that roadmap to how your path is going to align, you know, like for mm-hmm. myself, I find that, you know, people, different types of people start coming into your life because of what you attract and so on. Right. So, but I, I, and I just can't explain it. I feel like it really has a lot to do with my spirituality and the mindset and, and um mm-hmm. and like you, you mentioned like the four pillars like i think he's like you said mental spiritual emotional and physical right like mm-hmm. i 100 percent agree with that too um have, have you read the book um the 5 a.m club by robin sharma by any chance no i don't know that one the reason why i ask is um because in that book it, it, it specifically highlights these four pillars like okay. that book calls it the four pillars oh okay but, uh, but it's it's pretty cool and like yeah like again i can't explain it <laughs> it's just it's just like you know so, sometimes like you have an issue and it's like bam you know you you, you suddenly just all of a sudden out of maybe maybe out of coincidence or attraction like you meet this person that's able to help you with this problem or something, something right right yes i think it's all a lot in alignment right so again i'm just a student of the bob proctor coaching program and i know he you know he teaches consultants how to teach this i don't teach it yet Mm -hmm. but he talks about it's all science it's the science it's it's not it's following these laws of science of law of attraction law of you know vibration all of these that really you when you align and i believe it's so true i hear it you know we hear it story after story and people often say it's coincidence or this and it's like ah, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's coincidence. I don't think when someone says, "Oh, bad things happen to me all the time," and they walk around with a black cloud over them, and bad things keep happening, I don't think that's coincidence. It's you choosing to carry this black cloud with you, and there's where choice comes in again. What if we shift it? What if we decide I'm not someone with a black cloud? Yeah. What if I decide I want something different? And that when people decide that and they start stepping into that and taking action and being in alignment with that, so feeling it, really stepping into that emotion of, ah, life is sunshiny and not always cloudy. Things happen in alignment with that. Mm -hmm. And and it's just that it's part of how our our world works. It's amazing. Oh, Oh, yeah. So... I kind of want to talk about, you know, talking about choices now, like, or even, even not, not now, but like the whole theme of what we've just discussed about so far, a lot of it has to do with choices. I wanted to talk about your story, you know, your journey to the mental health and medicine field, you know, the start of that, because I like, we can all say like, Hey, that's a choice that you decided to make. Right. Mm-hmm. So I remember you tell you mentioning that you grew up in a blue collar family you know, mm-hmm. living paycheck to paycheck. And you're now determined to help to break that cycle by leading and teaching your family how to live fully, abundantly, and to set their own rules for life. Mm-hmm. So uh, for an individual, like that feels like they're living in a world where they are bound by rules not set by themselves and lack the abundance mindset. Like where does one start with breaking out of this? And can you also share your story as well, just to elaborate? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So let's see. I'll start with, I'll start with sharing an experience that happened with my son. Okay. Right? So being paying attention to like possibility. That's like a keyword right now from po- what's possible because he did something that most people do. I want that bike, but I can't have it. I want that thing, but I don't have enough money. I don't know how to do it. And so I said, Ashton, what if you could have that bike? What if you could make enough money? He's like, mom, that's like a thousand dollar bike. I said, okay, so it is. What if you could? He's like, I don't know. I said, well, start thinking that way. And he wanted to build his own BMX bike. Mm -hmm. He started saving his money. He asked for a seat for his birthday. He asked for the handlebars for Christmas. He has a bike. He built, he got the pieces in the mail for gifts. He built the bike. He has the bike. And I said, look at that, because you decided to believe you can. Now I said, that's like, he's like, I can't, yeah, like, I can't believe I actually have a bike that I chose to have. I said, yes, it's like that. Believe in it. Believe in it. And so, so that's how I'm practicing with my family and my kids and myself to stay 
in the belief of something because then we see possibility. What could I do? Mm-hmm. And so I think I think there's a level of that that goes way back where I, you know, someone said said to me, you know, I think you probably learned it more from your mom than you realize on this, even though you don't, you, I, you know, we sort of pick out like what we, like what we don't want from our parents. Yeah. You know, my mom <laughs> was like, kind of like, code, there was this codependent relationship, right? I was the fixer. I was the taking, take care of. That was the role I took on. And so then I said, okay, well, I'm going to be a therapist then because that's what I do. I take care of people. But there's that piece of her that I learned too that I don't always recognize, which is the possibility piece. You can be whatever you want. You can have whatever you choose. And so so my story goes back to childhood and, and just that. Like I had took on this role of caretaker. So I was one of those few people, I think, r- few people that say, I know what I want to be when I grow up. I want to help okay. people. Yeah. And so I did. I went to college and that was the struggle. So this story could be really long. I'll try not to, you know, you can just direct me if I go too long. But I knew I wanted to be a therapist. I knew in order to be a therapist, I had to go to college. Yep. And I was the first of several, several client, uh, not client, uh, cousins to get a degree in, like in college. It was one of my cousins that actually said to me, Dawn, you were the first one out of 15, 20 cousins, our generation, to go to college. I'm like, wow, wild. And then to get a master's degree. And my parents said, figure out what you're going to do after high school. Like, figure it out. Like, you know, we took care of you. Now you go do it. And we had to do it. So I had to do it. I had to figure it out. And I did. And so college was a struggle for me. Learn education, like now um, study, test taking. That was a challenge for me. But I knew I had to figure it out if I want to get to where I want to go. Mm-hmm. And so I had a time in college my first year where I almost failed out of college because I was having panic attacks and insomnia and anxiety. And and I knew I'm like, well, I have to figure this out because I want to get to where I want to go. And that's where I was introduced to meditation, breath work, mindfulness, because I was offered with through a doctor medication. I'm like, that's just not the path for me. I know it. There's something in me at 18. I knew there was more. Yeah. I knew there was something about the mind, the power of my uh, my ability to get to where I want to go, and it, it it was more than just in a pill. And so that's where I developed the meditation, mindfulness, and that's what took me into that path of oh, I can teach this. This is what I'm going to do as a therapist teach these practices where people can take control of their own life and again, see possibility. And so, you know, I go through my life and my journey and we learn, as, you know, it's like onion, right? You pull the layers back, Yeah. right? And so I found myself in another place of, um, so I have two bo- older boys and then twins came along. Oh. And the twins, you know, that's a story of itself because that was a pretty traumatic event. Like we almost lost them and, you know, but they are healthy and happy. They're 15 and a half now. So they're fabulous. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, great. Ashton, he's one of the twins that had got the bike. So he's, they're doing great. Um, but they were born and then my husband lost his job and we and we had just bought a brand new house because we have four boys now. Mm-hmm. And we just said, let's get a house where we can all fit comfortably. And I said, so he lost, my husband lost his job and I had to go to work because the job market was like 2008, 2000, where things were Ooh, not so great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the financial crash, yeah, yeah. Crash. And so he had he had trouble finding a job. I was working part-time, like part, part-time in practice. Um, and I thought, well, I have to find something full-time if we want to continue to feed our children. And, and But it was that old story of, come to the rescue, I got to fix, mm-hmm. I got to take care of. So I find myself in an environment, in a job that's literally killing me. Yeah. And just, it was uncom- It was just a toxic environment. The kids were in good hands. My husband was great. We had to have him in daycare for some point. Um, but I remember the specific day when I was praying. I prayed to God, I prayed, and this is that spiritual part, like, I need more. I need something here. I can't do this. I can't be fixing all the time. I'm killing myself. I'm ready to like drive into the sunset and leave everyone behind because I'm not benefiting anybody. I'm not helping anybody. Just putting food on the table is not enough. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, I was diagnosed with cancer. 
And for me, it was like, okay, what's this about? Yeah. <laughs> like, God, really? Is, is this what I really, this is what I'm going to handle. I can't handle this job and this toxic, but I can handle cancer. I, are you sure about this? So I did a little conversation and I said, okay, well, what's this about? And I remember it went back to choose Dawn, choose how you want to live your life. You don't have to rescue people anymore. You don't have to be the lifesaver. Mm -hmm. You can guide people. You can be the coach. You can enlighten and, and, and educate and teach and empower and inspire, but you don't have to save everybody. Yeah. And that was an, ex that journey was that experience to shed that layer of just go live your life and love what you do and inspire people, but you don't have to save people anymore. So I had to learn how to, to be the best therapist, be the best coach I can be. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was the, that gift of cancer was there to show me that, you know, Let's see, so that's, that was, um, an interesting adventure. Yeah. Which, you know, led me more towards the coaching, you know, practice of building a coaching program where I can do that a little bit more effectively, you know, guide people along that path rather than feeling like I have to save people. Yeah. Cause it's, it's almost sounds like you grew up in a very, like you, you grew up in an environment and you were programmed almost to, you know, to be, you, you were very responsible. That's what it sounds. That's what it sounded like. And I think this is something, this is an issue that I have. And you tell me if this is something that's similar to where you feel like you have the responsibility to make to things right. And it gets to the point where sometimes it can be a big issue where you take on additional responsibility, especially from others when in fact, others may also need to take on responsibility, responsibility for themselves as well. Right. And then that just mentally drains you. So does that, is that something that you, you also feel you struggle with a lot? <laughs> exactly exactly like we keep taking on like solve this problem help this person rescue yeah. and then we're empty like there was someone who said this like you can't pour from an empty cup and it was like yeah. oh, that's what happened i'm empty my body's breaking down like i can't give anymore and it, and then we for, we do we forget like there's that thing of selfishness comes in where it's like if i take care of myself i'm being selfish if i yes. you know that thing like self if i go away i'm being selfish if i don't want to if i say no to you i'm being selfish no it's called good self-care because sometimes we have to say yes to us it's yeah. it's just like they're playing right oxygen on me first so that i can give back to you in a healthy way 100%. And so, yeah, so that's, that is it. That's, and I think so many struggle with that. We've, we, we need to learn. It's important to learn how that balance of, I can fill myself up and I can be the best I can be. And yeah. so that I can give in the best way I know possible that helps lift you up, mm -hmm. not you depending on me, but I then now can help you lift yourself up and like a collaboration, right? We lift yeah. each other up together. And it's, it's like working smart, not just hard. And it's in a sense where, you know, I feel that when you have this self-care too, and when you take on this more, it's more of this mindset of working smart, mm -hmm. um, you give yourself less opportunities, opportunities of being taken advantage of. Yes. Whereas I, I like for myself, I've never really had to, I think I've been blessed with like my mom giving me lessons while growing up of not being taken advantage of. But I know a lot of friends and acquaintances that I've met that also like, they also take a lot of responsibility to the point where it's beyond their control. Like they usually take, yeah, it's evident. They get taken advantage of endlessly. And I'm, I'm just like, Oh goodness. Like <laughs> it's, it's a trend, I guess. <laughs> right. And it's sort of, it's that, um, and a really good example of that alignment, right? That mm -hmm. law of attraction. If yeah. we're, if we're givers, guess what we're going to really we attract in takers. Yeah. We're going to attract in people who want what we have to give mm -hmm. and take and take. And so when we wait a minute, I need to take care of myself. I need to feel confident with myself and it worthy of myself. And then we start then attracting in people who align with us. Yeah. And we can easily say, no, I can't give to you, but Hey, here's a resource for you. <laughs> here's how you can help yourself because I'm no longer going to just give and give until I'm depleted. Yeah. So uh, 
going going back to you meant like you telling us about your story i did have a co- couple points that came up that i wanted to ask you so you know how you said you grew up knowing what you wanted to be like were there any influences while you grew up where like you're like okay i knew i wanted to like be in the mental health profession because i was thinking like you know being in the mental health being in the mental health profession back let's say even five and ten years ago like it wasn't such a big thing it was always looked over right like there wasn't that mental health awareness at least in my opinion and being in the general public because um for myself as an immigrant family or coming from immigrant parents like and i think i can speak for the majority not all but the, the majority of immigrant parents like mental health is not not a thing I, I shouldn't say it's not a thing it's 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 not discussed about because mm-hmm. um there, there's almost like a tier where it's like you survival's first mm-hmm. and then if your mental health conflicts with survival like it's all it's always survival it's like it's like oh i i feel sad today but then you know the, the common ask, uh, question you get from your parents or my parents would be like oh but did you die you, you know like did you, did, right. are you starving like you have stuff to eat so what you know they're trying to take that gratitude mindset but in a very survivalistic method to put it in and there you go that then like you have that whole mental aspect just being shut down right so i guess going back to my question like like what how did you know like it was the mental health road or journey that you wanted to take by giving your gift of helping people right yeah so it's good question (laughs) i always had an interest in how the mind works Oh, okay. Like, there was just fascination with science, this, the mind. How does it work? And so, so part of my journey is again, I struggled in school. Like school, mm-hmm. I, there was this test. Like I couldn't take a t- test anxiety. Right? I yeah. couldn't. I would study. I would read. Um, my parents would give me all the study books and how to get. Uh, there was names for all these programs, and I would sit in front of a test and I would fail a test. When I got to college, I would sit in the front row. I, I first um, was going to be a psychology major, sitting in the front row, like just, you know, lecture halls, 200 people. And I'm like absorbing this and writing, taking notes. And I even had a little, back then we had like recorders, right? And I would record lessons because I knew college was pretty difficult, you know, it was going to be difficult. So I'm like using all the tools mm-hmm. to fail a test. Something about the mind fascinated me, and I, I honestly can't think back on what got me there. I'm guessing it was my mom because okay. she had, so as we talk as adults and she shares stories about her dad and her dad's stories about um, just the mind and how we can, like law of attraction. She said, oh, my dad used to talk about the law of attraction. So I think there were subtle messages from my mom that, that were planted that brought that, that information to me. Mm, But I also believe too, that there's this piece of spirit that just says you're meant for this. And somehow that was like turned on for me, right? Like I was aware of that. That's my path. I have to figure out how to do it well, but that's my path. There's something to it. Like, so when I went through the psychology program, I failed, I, I couldn't, I was failing tests because psychology is biology. So here's the brain. Here are the pieces of the brain. Here's how it works. Here's a test. You do well, great. You'll get your degree. Well, I wasn't doing well, so I had to figure out like, okay, I need a different degree path if I want to do well, if I want to do help people. So now it's funny. I study like crazy with the brain and how it functions, but not for a grade. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. You see. But it's uh, fascinating to me. How yeah. I think for myself i'm able to relate with the the schooling aspect too i like and i i felt that myself going through school i i have i'm at a a degree in commerce um and i struggled with it too um but my i I never told anyone like my parents my friends family i never told anybody and they actually never saw how hard i had to work and not like they do but it's about finding ways to, you know, go, go around it and, you know, oh. fi- figure things out. Right. So nice. that I really relate with because, and deep down inside, as I was going through the, the, going through that degree, obviously in my mind, it didn't feel natural. It, it felt very conflicting and it, it's, it was, it's almost an intuition where it's like, I, I know there's, there's gotta be a better way for myself. So I guess what I'm trying to get on with this or where I'm trying to lead to is, um, 
you know, you mentioned with the whole study and the test, test taking, I feel that actually a lot of individuals that are in school or in the social school education system right now, I feel that um, they do feel that like that they're, they're in that trap because um, have you, have you heard of Einstein's like uh, reference of, you know, telling, you know, let's say it's like, it's like telling you have all these animals that are known for their different gifts, but then you're, you're taking one obstacle course, which benefits only one animal to determine, you know, the legitimacy, intelligence, whatever that trait is. Right. And then it's like telling a fish to climb a tree when the, when the fish's like natural ability is to not climb but to swim so 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 like trying to bring that in like do you feel that our education system at this moment i don't want to say in the future because it could change um do you think there's a problem with like our education system on how it's modeled and how it's not catered to everybody where everybody has to cater to it or do you think in fact, it's actually the problem lies within the people where we just don't have enough tools for ourselves to like self tools, like, like, like you mentioned, meditation, breath work to prepare ourselves for that, for the system. Ah, what a good question, because both, right? It, in my opinion, it would then be both because to some extent, right? Wait a minute, let's back this up because you can let's OK, let's just talk about the fish yeah. climbing the tree. You can give all the tools to this fish and he's never going to learn how to climb because he's not built for climbing trees, mm -hmm. right? So we can learn all the meditation, mindfulness, breath work. It will enhance us and our gifts, mm -hmm. but it may not prepare us for something that we're really not meant for. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the gift of the mindfulness and self-awareness helps us to see more clearly what we're meant for rather than this like again subconscious 95 percent well we just go to college after high school or this yeah. is the path we do because it's what everybody else is doing that would give us this insight to say what is it what's for me you yeah. know what is really for me what's my path and if my path is that then i'll take that path you know and so mm -hmm. it's really learning what your path is and i mean i have two kids in college right now and that was a struggle because my one, my older son, he's 21, he's on his third year. And every, like every semester, I'm going to quit. I think I'm going to quit. I don't think I'm going to finish. I'm, I'm like, and at some point, at one point I was like, okay, well, you do have time to, to stop now. But at some point you got to keep, you just got to finish what you start. So some of it's like, how, like how much are you really struggling? is what you want to do. Do you need this edu this training to get to where you want to go? Like if I were to look back 23 years ago, could I have gone into a coaching program and done coaching 20 some years ago rather than the 10, 11 years ago when I did it to do what I'm doing? Yeah. Would I need the degree? No, but I didn't know it. I didn't know. I mean, I don't even know how popular coaching was 20 some years ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> So it's like, what do we know? What if I want to get to where I want to go? Like my son, he wants he's he has a real estate license. Well, can you sell houses without a real estate license? I don't think so. I mean, I don't know the market, but I don't think so. I think you need that license. So if that's what we want, if we want that end goal, then we sort of have to do what we have to do. Uh -huh. Does that make the system? Does that mean college in the system is is? doesn't need an overhaul no i think the, i think our education system could use an overhaul um yes i don't i mean i don't know a lot about like to give a lot of good information on what i think should be done yeah but i think we have so many gifts us each individuals have so much to contribute to the world and it doesn't always fit within the a university four-year box mm. on how to to get there yeah, I, I love that. I love how you phrase that. And um, I, I agree too, right? Like, and kind of, kind of elaborating on what you said earlier too, if it's, if you know what you want to be, let's, for example, like a doctor or a lawyer, like, or mm -hmm. let's say, let's say an accountant or some, or an engineer, like, unfor unfortunately, those are the routes you get. You have to go through that route because those mm -hmm. are the prerequisites, right? But then right. it's, like you said, it's not, a, it's not a, all about just getting the degree, and just find doing one of those like we there's it's about knowing your gifts and 
you know, aligning yourself, right? And oh, that's so powerful, Dawn. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, I qu- quick question. I'm just going to take a pause here. Um, how are you doing for time? Because I just realized, like, we've been talking oh. for 40, like, it were, like, I feel like we 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 just started. And, yeah, I feel like, like we did. I'm I'm good. You're good. I'm okay. Good. I'm actually good until one o'clock. Okay, cool. We'll, so we'll, I mean, we'll just keep time. it rolling then. Yeah, because I this is so I love these conversations. They're so good. So yeah, <laughs> okay. no rush on my end. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, so so then um, let's let's see here. Um, so you mentioned. Your practice of self-empowerment and desire to understand the human potential was catapulted in 2010. You know, and you mentioned with your ca- then this was the time when you had your cancer diagnosis. Right. Um, first off, is this a chapter that you're willing to share with our audience, especially at like, you know, going through cancer? Like that's also something I hit hits home, home to myself too with my mom. And um, I first I wanted to ask is like, at what point through your battle up with cancer did you practice? Did you did your practice like and your and desire catapulted? Because like I feel that when you go through cancer, almost every every individual go, that goes through cancer, they have different stages that they see. And what what I mean by these stages are they're more so mental, and they could be, you know, stages of acceptance. And the, an example of that would be, oh, I have cancer, okay, or stages of exhaustion where it's like, oh. I have cancer, but I I can't beat it. I'm gonna give up soon or whatever. It's 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 about like their mind is also th- it's about I'll, I'll live the best life I have, but I know I'm going to die when or at a certain date. Or there are you know stages of denial where there's like oh I have can like you've been told you have cancer but you don't want to accept it. So right. like I guess going back to the question like at what point with your battle with cancer uh, did your practice and desire catabol or at which stage? Because every again uh, let me elaborate as well like everybody ev- not everybody goes through these stages right but there's a there's a common theme Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I think that I mean okay so for me I'll speak for for me like in order for me to to really live fully yeah and move through cancer well I have to embrace it Mm -hmm. from a spiritual perspective like this is an experience that I have I can learn from and so the day so it's it was an interesting journey so it's so funny some of these moments were like yesterday right so i'm standing on my front porch i had to have a biopsy it was not good and and in in a way that i should have stayed home from work for a couple days like to rest but i was still in the take care of things mode there was still a even though this is just 11 years ago there was still pieces of me that were still in the fix it mode even though i went through school and did my whole all my assignments and my own work and my own therapy still there was layers of that still there and that's what this was like a like an aha but i stood on my front porch wait like the doctor was gonna call and my husband's standing with me and i'm like ready to go off to work and he's like phone call comes and the doctor's like yeah it's cancer so that's a whole nother way another story on how they present that to people right but anyway that was my experience standing on the front porch okay tell my husband he's looking at me like like what just happened and i'm like okay we'll talk after work i gotta go and i went off to work and and it was an inter and i didn't stay long because it was it was a bad day (laughs) and i realized what am i doing like i need to get home i need to but i was in that fix it i got a fix mode like Uh i gotta take care of it i gotta look it up i get what is this what kind of cancer is this and so, so the cancer I was diagnosed with was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so it's a blood cancer. So what the medical experts say is that it's typically a cancer that older people get, like 60-year-olds. I was like 30, what, how old am I? Oh, I'm 50. So I was like 39. So oh, wow. 39, and I'm getting an old, can, old person's cancer. You know, that doesn't feel good. <laughs> like, no. Not at all. I'm like wow, what is this about? And they're like, well, and, and likely you're not going to die from this. You're going to, you'll die from something else. But I'm like, but if my body's responding as if it's in its sixties, who knows how I'm going to die? Like nobody knows how you're going to die. So that was like major, like put the brakes on what is happening here. Mm-hmm. Well, again, I was under a lot of stress with work. My, the way I just, again, 
was it nature versus nurture? I'm more of a higher strung person, which is what drew me to meditation and mindfulness. I knew it was something I needed. Yeah. And it were, you know, I embraced it. I love it. Um, but my body was responding to what was happening to the way I was internalizing things, the way life was happening. And I had to pause and go, wait a minute, what's this about? And I, there was a point for me where I said, I'm not doing therapy anymore. I quit. I'm done. I don't want to help anybody. <laughs> I can't even help myself. I'm not going to help anybody. And so I took, is it two years? I think I took two years off. Treatment didn't take two Did it take two years? Maybe it did. Took a while. I was exhausted. I had babies, two babies at home, two, to, no, two, you know, pre, not, uh, two school age kids at home and two babies at home. So I was exhausted. So took time off and just took, just took care of myself. And it was like, okay, because I really, I've never not worked. Mm -hmm. Again, blue collar family, 16 years old, get a car, get a job, work through high school, right? That's what you yeah. do. And then you go to college and you got to work through college because you got to pay for college. You got to pay off those loans. You gotta... So I've always worked. So I was like, I'm taking time off. But I'm like, I'm taking time off for cancer. Like this is like, what's this about? But I did. I took time off and went, this is the time for me. I got to figure this out. And so what was interesting is I took care, of, took care of myself, made sure I wasn't gonna die, make sure yeah. I was gonna be around for my kids, make sure then I was gonna be the best I could be. So not just survive, but then like thrive in my life, be the best I can be as a mom, as a wife, as, a, as then determine like how am I gonna, what do I wanna do for my work, my fulfillment? Because yeah. I, I like that, I like what I do. And I found myself keep finding, um, what I would kept being drawn to were my mindful magazines or my yoga. I was, I'm also a yoga teacher. So I did yoga teacher training in 2005. Mm -hmm. So I was already in that, um, that environment. So I kept finding that in front, read, I want to read because I would, I would say, I'll oh, just read novels, just read stuff that doesn't matter. And I kept being drawn back to that. And I'm like, okay, that's that spirit for me. That was that intuition. That spirit said, this is where you're supposed to be. You can do it. Well, you can do it for yourself and you can do it for others. And so it started to, my eyes started to open up and the light was shining a little bit brighter to go, I do like this. I do want to keep helping people. I just had to figure out how to do it well. Ah. So I didn't sacrifice myself for it anymore. Oh, so that wow. was, you know, part of that. That was kind of that awakening. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, one thing very interesting that I, I do want to bring up and wanted to know your thoughts on this because this is also something, in my opinion, and um, I, I, I do martial arts, like I'm a martial arts practitioner, but a lot of my background is from Eastern martial arts. So they, in Eastern martial arts, they believe there's, it's not just like the body isn't just one, you know, you have your mental side, you have your, body, your physical side, again, you have your different pillars and spiritual mm -hmm. side. So you mentioned the body age, right? Like when you had cancer, they're saying, oh, you're essentially your body is the age of, of 60 year old. Do you feel that um, the current measurement we have for age is very deceptive of how our bodies are actually are like from a mental aspect and the physical aspect. And what I mean by that is, you know, for, for, for example, you could have, let's say, quote unquote, let's say a 19 year old that's gone through a lot of life experience. So from a mental aspect, they're super mature. You, some would say from mentally, they meant they're like the age of a 40 year old or, or a 50 year old. Right. Or another example would be, like you said, like uh, I'll, you can have individuals where, you know, they do a lot of, they drink a lot, they smoke a lot or what, what are, not saying drinking, you know, drinking and smoking is like the super, super bad. I, I believe everybody has their choices, right? Mm -hmm. But now are, they have their choices and they are entitled to their choices. Um, but, you know, they do these things that harm their body. Mm -hmm. And physically you look 23, but your body is of a 70 year old. Like, do you feel that that measurement of using age to, to judge our, the body, the actual physical aspect of things and the mental aspect of things is a, is a, is a correct way or is a, is a right way of, you know, um, assessing or putting that threshold on someone or an individual. Yeah. I think, I think age is, you know, like relative, right? So mm -hmm. 
I'll have I'll have clients who'll say to me, "Yeah, my parents like you know they can't take care of themselves anymore, and you know they're getting old. They're old, so they you know they need help, and they oh how old are they? Seventy something. Like oh okay, my in laws." They're in their mid 80s and they're bike riding and they're traveling and they're actually taking a road trip today into Mon they're in Montana as we speak. Wrote and they're in their 80s. Wow. <laughs> Biking, kayaking and sailing. They have a sail 30 some foot sailboat. They still sail. So I think a lot of our our body, this is just our shell, right? This is yeah. just the, the vessel we've been given to go through this life. OK, we don't have all the answers. Let me just say that we don't always know and can't control everything that happens to this body. But the mind and our emotional state will show up in our cells. Mm -hmm. And that will age us. It can age us or it can help us stay vibrant and healthy and well. Um, Deepak Chopra, he has a yeah. quote that I love. Um, every cell in your body is eavesdropping on every thought you think. Wow. Love that. Yeah, it's it's funny because like I, I, I tune into a lot of Deepak, Deepak's work, but I've never heard this quote. <laughs> Love that quote. It's like one of my, wow. and I don't remember what book it's in. And I did look it up to make sure I was quoting him properly. But that is his, that is his quote based mm -hmm. on my resource. <laughs> and I was like, that is, that's it. That's what it is. That's for me. That's what I'm, I express to people like our, the power of our thoughts will affect our being, the physical being, um, our emotional being, our, it, it affects us. It'll age us or again, it'll keep us vibrant because it does. I mean, it does. The power of the mind to me is so powerful. And so just looking at our life age-wise, just physical age, just um, how many years we've been on this planet, it's, it's relative. Again, I've you know, I had my husband's grandmother died at 99 and until the day she died, we were having a conversation and and talking and and then somebody else who's 70 has dementia and they're in a home and they can't take care of themselves. You know, a lot of the study I do when I just I'm not an expert in this area, so I won't go into detail, but the studies of like those um, mental disorders like Alzheimer's and if we dig dig deep into the spiritual and really those experts that study it there's aspects of it that are emotionally tied you know this denial of life and this unhappiness and this emotional it has an impact on us mm -hmm. it has an impact oh, wow thank you for sharing that and i think that's that is such a great explanation of how you know, it also, it all really all in, in reality, it does stem from the mind. And for our listeners, it doesn't mean like, hey, if, if you have a body of a 60 year old that, you, that, that you're well matured or whatever, like that, not in that aspect, it means like, hey, like maybe we got to step aside and reevaluate what's really bothering us and, you know, have that self-awareness, right? And to see what mm -hmm. we can do about it. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, we have to I pay attention. Just like you said with, like this kind of brings up going back to when you talked about like that it was really like a stigma of mental health right yeah. like yeah like survival and then okay go live your life and if, as long as you're not in survival mode just go live your life and mental health emotional health is it gets overlooked yes. so often and it's so important i mean when we were in that like 2008 two, like i was working part part time somewhere and i said i need full-time work my husband just lost his job and they're like dawn the, the people aren't coming because of the like the economic downturn like people cut out mental health they like they're in survival mode it's like but part of our survival is good mental health yes you know it's so critical and it's like we have to remember that's part that's such a relevant part we can't separate the four pillars they're all important mm -hmm. they're all important in order for us to have really good healthy vibrant lives yeah and for myself, like, like you said, the four pillars, like, um, I personally have like a to-do list every day mm -hmm. and I, and I, there's always an activity to help, to help fulfill one of those pillars. And uh, is this something that you also have as well? Or because yeah. it's, it's, it's so crucial. And for my, and again, like I, I do see a difference. Like I, I notice a difference. Uh, they're very small and some days are losses, but 
you know, it's about being consistent, right? And but then right. if you do like a reflection or a, when I did a reflection of where I was a year ago or two years ago, mm. the the changes have snowballed and that's when you start realizing, oh my goodness, like this, like I'm I'm doing it for myself and going back to like you said, self-love. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like it's like, wow, like I'm so proud of myself. Yes, yes. <laughs> When I started um, a morning meditation, a morning practice, and that's what it was called, the, the, the practice I do called Intensati, when I signed up to be a teacher yeah. in 2016, when I signed on, she, Patricia Moreno, who's the creator of Intensati, and Intensati means mindful intention. And so, and I can say more about that in a second, but when we first, when I was signing on for that teacher training, she added on a morning practice, a one-year morning practice commitment. And I'm like, I got to think this through. You know, I did meditation. I did yoga. I did, but it was like here and there. I mean, I have kids. So it was like whenever I could squeeze it in, right? Yeah. Morning, pre- start every morning in meditation and journaling and breath work. Like, ah, when do I have to get up in order to do that before the kids get up, <laughs> before I start my day? And I was like, oh, wow. And so I did. I committed to it, did it for every day, like for a year. Like, so I still do it, but it, th- like we're human, right? Like you said, things happen and we miss a day. But this is my practice, morning practice, uh, journaling, breath work, meditation, my to do's, right? Gratitudes. And I remember it was at the end of that first year, and we got to the group of us got together um, for an event and we to talk about it. What was the experience like? And I remember she asked me, she said, what was the most significant change from this morning practice? And I went, hmm, let me think. And I had to step back and think about it. And the thing that popped in my head, I don't yell at my kids. I oh. don't yell at my kids. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think I've yelled at my kids like in a year. Like, like it was that significant? I'm like, I didn't expect that. But I was like, like any parent, sometimes short-tempered, pick up your socks, you know, like just put your dish in the dish. Like you snap because you're just, you're doing life, right? And what this morning practice gave me that I didn't realize it was going to do was it allowed me to be a better parent as well. Yeah. I could take a breath, not just for myself and the work I do, but also like in the way I interact with my kids and my family, like I can take a breath and talk calmly and, and model like, healthy compassionate communication you know and i didn't expect that to happen yeah you know because really me like losing it with my kids every now and then wasn't like a huge deal i was i don't expect to be perfect right like it wasn't huge significant but the fact that it was impacted yeah from a daily practice of self-reflection and self-care was like that's a bonus that's huge yeah it's 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 so interesting how you mentioned that because you, you you know um, I I was introduced to meditation through from a martial arts aspect right but then like same with breath work now it, it's it's funny because they don't when when people are doing meditation or whatever it's it's not marketed as oh you want you want to lose you you want to like stop yelling at your kids you want to start start grabbing grasping control of your life like take meditation try this try that it's more so like meditation is i don't know it's or these practices are it's almost as it aligns yourself to who you are and it it kind of i i, I don't know how to explain it but again like you said it helps kind of helps you as an individual helps an individual like be more attuned to themselves and ap- approach things in a different calmer manner is that how i would how i would say it like yeah. what, what are your thoughts on that <laughs> yeah i would say you're right like right and then it like helps you be more awake and yeah and, like more aware like more in the conscious space of your day right because me yelling at my kids was automatic subconscious like snapping right don't do this did it but but being in that place of where you're mindful yeah you're more in that conscious state of res- responding rather than reacting. Yeah. You know? Uh, okay. That's how I see it. So is it Victor Frankl who says, um, uh, let's see, between stimulus and response is a space. Yes. And in that space is your uh, place to choose. You have the ability to choose. 
And so mindfulness gives us that ability to see the space. Yeah. <laughs> <Stimulus> <laughs> response and like, ah, because it's training, right? Mind, I call meditation like a mind training tool. We're training our mind to slow it down, to mm -hmm. be present. And so when we're in that practice, right, practice, so that having a morning practice, then it, it that we're, we're training for life. Mm -hmm. Just like if I'm running, so I run, I'm training for a half marathon. I don't do marathons, half. I don't just get up and go run a, mar a half marathon. I have to train for it so that when the day of the race comes, I'm ready to go. And so meditation, mindfulness is that training for life so that you practice, just like you brush your teeth and take a shower, you're ready for your day. You're practicing so that you're equipped. Yes. To be present in your life. Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing that, Don. Uh, now, I kind of, I kind of want to dive into, let's say, the profession and the external awareness aspect, really quickly, and then I followed, followed after that would be the internals. But externally, like, what are three of the most common diagnoses or problems that you have encountered with, you know, the individuals that you have worked with? Like, I understand this may be, you know, this could potentially be a conflict of interest when it comes to specific details, but I'm just acquiring from a general perspective, you know, yeah. based on what you've acquired. So mm -hmm. like, um, would they, yeah. So what would be three most common diagnoses, di diagnosis or problems with individuals that you tend to see come, come towards your table or put the, put on your plate? Right. So the majority. Yeah. And if I look back over my years of working with people, it's been pretty much consistent is, um, Stress, stress, anxiety, depression. I think they're sort of, in my opinion, they're under one, like an umbrella, but they can all be diagnosed, you know, minor depression, major depression, mm. anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder. But I'm not a fan of diagnosing. So I just leave that for my notes and what the insurance wants me to do. Yeah. But really all that, like dep if we look at depression, it's tied to like stress or self-image. Who mm -hmm. am I? And do I, do I take care, you know? Am I worthy kind of a thing that ties in? Uh, sometimes people will come who um, are in abusive situations, um, child, from childhood abuse. Um, I don't work with severe, say like schizophrenia, um, some personality disorders, but not very often. So the majority are stress. Stress, anxiety. wow. Yeah. And it's, and it's, what is it? Seven, I don't know today's statistic, but it was, it did get up to like 80% of all hospital visits are stress related. Okay. Yeah. Huge stress. That's... And so then we have to take a look at and go, okay, so I can have an impact on that. And I know when I say that to some clients, they're like, Don, I can't, I can't control my boss and I can't control COVID and I can't control. No. But if we refer back to Viktor Frankl, yes, we can control and choose how we show up in these situa situations. Mm -hmm. We get, we, you know, there's this, um, and I don't know who said it, but don't pray for life to be easier, but pray for the strength. Mm, yeah. You know, handle life because that's all we can do. We, there's so much out here we cannot, we can't control. We know that. I can. I can work on strengthening myself so that when these situations happen, I know what the best choice is. What's my next step, my next best step, mm -hmm. you know? And so stress and anxiety, such an internal thing. It, yeah. it, it is. I mean, and I've talked to my clients before about, okay, if we're not, if we're talking about a survival issue, like you're being abused every day physically, let's just use that as an example. Okay, we're in a survival space. So we need to talk about getting out of that. That's dangerous. That's life threatening. Mm -hmm. But once we're in a place and very few of the clients I work with are in that space, it's we're in our our needs are our basic needs are met. We're not in survival mode. Our basic needs are met, but we're in this place of the mind, the fight or flight is on overload because we're perceiving everything in the world, not everything, but a lot of the stuff in our world is dangerous. And that's when the brain, that fight or flight goes haywire. And then we have that filter on. And so it's like, it's about teaching clients to, to 
we we have an impact on that. We yeah. can change the way we see things and, wow. and no longer experience the world in that very stressful way because we don't, that part of the brain doesn't need to be firing if the house isn't burning down. Yeah, I, I love how you put it that way. Yeah. And now, I, just out of curiosity, have you heard of um, Dr. Gabor Mate? He's, he's like a trauma specialist and, um, okay. and he... He also, he's someone I follows. Uh, I, I, I'm more so, he's, he's like a, an addiction specialist as well. Okay. And I, I read a lot of his work. And I think the reason why I do is because I do resonate with a lot of it and the reasoning. And you mentioned stress and he mentioned, like he also mentions how stress and trauma is one of the biggest things. And, you know, going back to cancer, um, how, mm-hmm. how, like my mom's had cancer. She's fought it three times. And mm-hmm. it's, it's the same one that come, keeps coming back and back. But, y- you know, it's, they say, some doctors say it's your diet. Some, some doctors say it's your genetics. But at, at the end of the day, like reflecting now and ever since, you know, doing more research on how stress can really impact your like once in life, I realized that every time my mom had cancer preceding that actual diagnosis, she's had something actually very drastic to change her stress levels. And, and, and I, I, again, I'm no doctor, I'm just a civilian in our world. And I'm just putting what my understanding is. All right. But I find that like, I'm a true believer, like you said, stress is something that, and, and this ties into what you said earlier, right? What they start some of the emotional mind and spiritual and emotional mind of the mind, which right. impacts their physicality and whatsoever. And your cells are like Deepak was saying, your cells are in listening, right? So big believer of that and thank you for thank you so much for like sharing that because i feel like stress is just it's almost accepted as the norm <laughs> it is it is and it, and it doesn't have to be and right? that's, that's my mission like no stress doesn't have to be the norm we don't have to live this way yeah it can be different now so if i was to ask you like have you noticed i i think you kind of you probably you you probably mentioned or ham- hammered uh, or answered this a little bit early on, but have you noticed a difference with the common diagnosis or problems you have now with a lot of the, your clients versus individuals that back in the day when you first started? Now, I I guess the reason what what why I'm asking this question is I I'm curious if you know if there's like a new diagnosis or new emerging diagnosis or whether it's stress or depression that's gone up in terms of percentages now compared to back then? Like if there's like a trend or a comparison of how impactful things are now versus back mm. then. Yeah, that's interesting. Very interesting. And it's funny, I'll just say this. Okay. I remember when I was younger and my mom, what was she, she would say, oh, oh, oh okay. So I was younger and it was the grandparents that would say, oh, I'm so glad I'm not raising kids in this day, right? Yeah. And I have kids and then my mom is saying, oh, I'm glad I'm not raising kids in this day. And then I'm looking at my kids going, oh, my God, I can't imagine what's going to be like when you guys are raising your kids. All these little pieces of like stress, right? Like, yeah. okay, you know, cell phones and the Internet came in and it was like going to make everybody's life easier. <laughs> and guess what? We're more stressed. Mm-hmm. And do we have to be? No. Technology could actually really work for our benefit if we didn't look at the crap yeah. and we just looked for the positive. I mean, it, it, this might be a really good example. I think perception is really where I'm getting to is perception. How do we perceive what's around us? I um, Some people like to follow a lot of the politics and a lot of the drama, right? If, For example, I'll ta- have a client that I very stressed, especially when this new, when the pandemic started, very stressed. I just, I'm working from home. I live alone. Okay. What are you doing first thing when you wake up looking at my phone? Okay. How long are you on your phone for? Oh, I don't know. Probably hours. I'm scrolling. What are you looking at? Well, the numbers and this, how are you supposed to feel good if you're looking at negativity and trauma? And so, and then I had um, someone else say, oh my gosh, didn't you see that post? And didn't you see that post? And I'm like, no. When I go and look at the stuff I look at on my Facebook feed and my social media, 
it's Christopher Kai and, you know, Bob Proctor and manifesting abundance in your life because that's what I look at. That's what I, I bring in. I'm not liking thumbs up or thumbs downing the stuff I don't want to see. I don't, I let it go. Let it go. Because if we start paying attention to it, it keeps showing up more, right? Yeah. So what are we paying attention to? So whether it's today or 50 years ago, believe me, I mean, I've, there are more things in the world. I mean, I'm 50. I have a 21 year old, a 19 year old and 15 and a half year old. So I remember when phones were just attached to the wall. And when you left for vacation or left the house, you couldn't call your kid. My, when I was gone, my mom just, Dawn, you're going to be home at this time. Okay. I know where my kids are while well, they're in school now, but like, you know where everyone is. You can call them in a second. So sure, things have changed, but I think really the key is perception. How we perceive the world is really going to be what impacts our health and our wellness. Yeah, no, that's, I, that, that's a, such a good way to put it too. And I, I was going to ask you, um, when it came to technology, do you think that we're, we are exposing our kids to technology too early at a young age yes. and our, you do? <laughs> I do. I, because they don't know how to regulate. Hmm. They're, they're children that that the phones the the computers that's a, like an open door to like you know i mean i i try i try to like edit myself well but like you know like pornography like x-rated like everything's on there like it's like here you go here your seven-year-old unless you have those um blocks set right so here's what i did i'll just share what i did when my kids got to high school that's when they got cell phones before okay. my kids in high school they didn't have a cell phone and my husband disagreed with me but i'm still the main you know he works his 40 hour a week job i'm still the one who has to pick them up from football and get them here and there and and he was opposed he actually was opposed to them having phones at all so i i should explain he's on that end <laughs> so we were both in line with not letting them have phones period um, and then one family lap, you know, family laptop so that we know what they're on and, and then blocks and all that good stuff. Um, but it was, for me, it was, it was taking control and me deciding when and why I want my children to have a phone. There's no pay phones in schools anymore. So no pay phones were at the corner gas station. Pay phones were at, so when I was a kid, if I needed to call my parents, I just needed a quarter in my pocket and I could find a phone, call home, come get me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, today there's no pay phones anywhere. So at least that's what I've noticed, at least around where I'm at. So when my kids got to high school, my rationale was they need a phone because if their practice is gonna run an hour late or they needed me to pick them up early, I want them to call me and there's no pay phone at the school. Yeah. So that was my rationale. If a child is giving, getting handed a phone at seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I would want to know why. Okay. Why? It's it's funny because I, I personally I agree with you. I, I remember, but I I, I I remember when I was seven, eight, nine, I was playing with crayons. Right. <laughs> was, but but right. now but but then uh, like you said, perception and time times are changing. I do I do understand like times are different now, but it's just making that comparison, I find it really hard to believe. It's like kids nowadays they they won't even know what a pay phone is right. <laughs> or like nope. or a circular dial-up phone <laughs> right when we said we got this um our internet is funky here um just because of the woods and stuff but we got like a, a like an extender a booster for our internet yeah and the, my I had my my one um son jonathan he likes to he likes buttons and and technology and i said read the instructions and set it up for me because i don't know how to do it. and i just give him something to do right yeah like, okay, so let's plug it into a jack. What's a jack? <laughs> like, you know what, a jack. You plug the phone into a jack in the wall. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Because we don't have, I mean, they're in, our house is older, so it, it, it has phone jacks, but we don't use them. Yeah. And they don't even know what it is. So it's like a whole different world. <laughs> so it, we do forget, like, things have changed. Mm-hmm. 
but the 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 understanding is that we have control yeah you know i have i have clients that that's been a bit but they would you know in session they'd bring their phone with me look at so and so keeps calling and so and so they keep texting look at i'm like first i don't want to see it and why are you reading it oh well i have to okay why are you calling them back i have to who says yeah I, 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 you get to decide there's this thing called voicemail and way back when there was a thing called an answering machine and way back before then there was not an answering machine and if people didn't catch you at home they didn't get to talk to you yeah so it's we get to set our rules we don't have to be victims to the stuff that comes up generation after generation we get to decide if it's okay mm -hmm. you don't have to answer the phone you don't have to let your kids have a cell phone because the neighbors have a cell phone why why am I choosing the life I'm living? I get to decide. It doesn't matter what other people think. And I think that's really important for us to remember. Get out of that subconscious programming and choose. Even the little things or the big things, however you see technology, big or little, choose, we get to decide. You know, if I don't want my kid being on the phone or technology or internet after 9 p.m., I can turn it off. <laughs> I can pull the thing out of the wall. It's up to me. Like. What's the best, how's the best way we can live a really healthy, wonderful, fulfilled life? We get to decide that. So can we talk about mindfulness? Because you mentioned it. And I feel that, um, you know, mindfulness is a very common term that's been used, thrown around in the whole coaching or even just like the whole space of social media and especially in the self-development. Um, it's coming up a lot more now, isn't it? And, and it's coming up more and more. Um, but like, if you, obviously mindful, mindfulness, like we can look at dictionary.com or look at a dictionary of what it means, but what does mindfulness mean to you in your own words? Yeah. So in my words, it, it means being aware, being present. Okay. Like in every moment, like just being in it. Like one thing I make a commitment to, and again, I'm not perfect. I do my best. And with two 15 year olds, they, in, if they're around, they interrupt a lot. But one of the commitments I make is if they come to me, stop what I'm doing and look them in the eye. Yeah. Be aware of what they're saying. Be tuned in. You know, and that to me, that's mindful, being really aware and, and, and conscious and connected. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally, um, I feel that one of the one of the best bosses I've ever had work, work, working for um, I call her like my second mother. I, she's no longer my boss and we still keep in touch. Um, but I think now that, now that you mentioned this and you mentioned your examples, that's one of the things I, I remember the most about that boss. Like, and the thing is not only is she being mindful, but for me on the other end, other end of things, I'm super receptive to it. And it also like, there's, there's a impact to that as well to the, right. So um, sorry, I cut you off there, but I just wanted to share. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because again, what is the message to you? Like if she's paying attention to you, like, then you feel like this is important. Yeah. You know, this interaction is valuable. It's important. And I think every, every interaction is important. Every interaction is valuable. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Louise Hay. She uh, was... no, sorry, but. Okay. No, she's, so she's an older woman. She's passed, but she does, she's many self help books and um like you can heal your life is one of her books she was being interviewed by someone and i remember she had said um they said something about um you know kill two birds with one stone and she's like why would you want to kill two birds with one stone why would you want to rush through anything why would you want to like try to speed anything up and get two things done quicker you know and it was like ah that's Right, like embrace everything we go through. Like those mind, be mindful in those moments of like, why rush through anything? And and oh. I know, again, is it my nurture? Is it nature? I have a tendency to be that A personality, go, you know, get this done, get this, the checklist. Yeah. When I was a very young girl, my mom made me this little plaque that was, um, stop and smell the roses. <laughs> <laughs> I think, wow, I know, I get it. And it's like, and it is, it's that I remember it and it was true. It's like, just pause, just be, just be here now. Just be in the moment mm -hmm. um, to embrace those moments because, you know, it, it goes like that. 
it, 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 it does. And, you know, not you mentioned that. And it, it, it's got me thinking, too. Like, yeah, why, why wouldn't you want to kill two birds with one stone? But then you also did highlight, like, essentially, and for many individuals, including myself, we've become so task focused and it's like a checklist to the point where we're no longer present and our intention is not to actually there. But right. wow, thank you for sharing that, Dawn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just, just savoring. Like, I mean, I think about what just came up for me and just thinking about that is like, you know, our first home we bought, you know, we had some apartment, you know, a couple apartments, but then the home, our first little home was a small little ranch with the, with the boys. And it's, and I, I think I was as a mom, not that I want to toot my own horn, but maybe I do. I don't know. I love being a mom and I, you know, I worked very part time and I played in the mud with them and I, we had fun and we just were in those moments. But I also do remember when it was like, when are we going to get the bigger home, you know, a little bit bigger home. And when we look back and go those moments in that tiny little house was like so fun. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we miss those moments, we don't get to savor them. We miss them, you know, and then we're always looking for the next best thing, the next best thing. And, and it's like, no, just savor every single moment. You know, there's, they mean something. They're so important and just be, just be present. Yeah. So then with mindfulness or conscious living, like how, how does that align with the human potential? Like, yeah. I, this well, is I this is probably a really loaded question, but That's a, yeah, it is. It's it's, it's it's just the reason why I ask is I I find that in a society today, and you know, like it even I've got go through it a lot. I see it a lot. It's like, oh, this person has a lot of potential. Uh, let's say from a career aspect, it's like, who do we want to hire? I think I want to pick this person because you know um, they have more potential, more upside, or in the future versus this person now. Blah blah blah. Right. So. Um, yeah. So how, how does it for like, how does mindfulness or conscious living align with it? Yeah. 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 It's a good question. And I think, um, when we think about our potential, like to be the best we can be, yeah. if we're not mindful, we won't know our potential. You know, we mm. go into this follow, follow mode. Oh, I do this. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is how it's supposed to go and check off the checklist. And then another day comes and we're doing the same thing and we don't, tap into that yeah the, our potential to be our best to be the the best human like the best human we can be you know and mm -hmm. we're pretty limitless like really we think about it like think about the fact that somebody created a cell phone that somebody created an airplane that flew some lights that came from a human being somebody who just was tapped into the ability to create something yeah there was no light bulbs before the light bulb. There was no airplane before the airplane. There was no phone. Someone cre like tapped into this vision, this this inner knowing of something. And if like if, if we're not mindful in it and stay with it and persist and stay true to that passion, we won't really like say fulfill that potential that we have that's in there. Yeah. So, do you believe in the limit limitless pill and the concept of you know there's this one action or this one thing that can all of a sudden just you know open up your, your mind and you become limitless or do you think that to be limitless it's a, it's actually a consistent journey of self-development and self-work and self-awareness to get to that stage because yeah, very cool um well i think it's a journey because mm -hmm. i think we always have choices yeah there, i think we're always presented with like a pet like pick one yeah <laughs> right like when we get to this like this i always think of it as like an onion you peel one layer yeah and you're like ah but then you're like oh but now there's another path which one do i take it's a continual i think journey mm, okay that's how i see it well i love that aspect and you know what i think so too like have you heard you have, i'm sure you probably read the book or like seen the movie limitless or, or heard it referred where I like haven't, i've watched it i think once or twice but i've heard about it so a little brief but yeah, yeah. But the concept of it i was like oh interesting because i feel that I'm, i like i like the idea that 
you know, we're showing people that, hey, you can be limitless and this does exist mm-hmm. to the point where you can be what you want to be and, you know, you can have all these things, you can build your mind up to that level. But I don't like that holy, that, that uh, holy instant gratification aspect of it where it's like I take a pill and bam. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think that, I, yeah, I, the journey part, I think is, uh, is, a, is a key part to it in our world yeah okay so so then um what about the int- intensity is it intensity intensity yeah intensity method like yeah. can you can can you share with us what what is this method and like or yeah can, just yeah. to start off so fun so i'll i'll, I'll share with first how i found it so okay. being in yoga and mindfulness practices and therapy and again, having kids at home, I, I would buy, um, well, first it was on VHS, right? Video, re- I would do my workouts at home. You know, yeah. I wasn't a gym person. I would work out at home. Kids are in the bouncy seats or the play pens or whatever they were called. And um, I was always looking for like, like more, like learn more, learn more. And I came across this woman, Patricia Moreno, and she did these workouts with, um, dance and yoga or or kickboxing and yoga and I'm like I like her energy and then I couldn't find her anymore and I said oh I need to find her like there were no more videos and then I found her and she created this program called Intensati and Intensati comes from two words Inten comes from the word intention okay and then Sati means mindfulness so mindful intention and so I found her found found the videos and and that's my my pra- my workout at home and what it is it's um it incorporates dance martial arts um kickboxing yoga all in one okay so the practice is breath work it's mindfulness it's setting an intention and then the there's a body of the practice which is cardio high energy low impact movement with affirmations oh and yes with affirmations as we're moving we're saying affirmations and it's like a call and response kind of a class and it can be set up like a workout it's a workout because you sweat you can really like because moving the body is part of the action right of stepping into the our potential or stepping into who we want to be we have to practice it yeah and it's not just sitting in it mentally we have to actually then feel it and move and the practice of intensity allows you to feel that emotional state while you're saying these words, these new words, I'm stronger today, right? And and I'm enough instead of I'm not good enough, I'm unworthy, it's I'm enough, I am enough, while we're actually moving the body. So we feel like, oh, I'm feeling it. Yeah. It's like an all-in-one practice. And it was just this powerful practice of just like waking up all the senses. Mm -hmm. And I would practice it, um, like I said, at home as my workout and I just loved it. And then there was a time when I was um, experiencing another round of um, cancer. So lymphoma, so it comes up in the lymph node. So I had a, like a third of, I think I've had three treatments, might have been four. I, I just don't count them anymore. <laughs> so, um, And I was frustrated and I'm doing the workout and my husband says, oh no, he said, let's pull out the video. That's what he said. He goes, let's do intensity. You need to like relieve the stress you have because i had to figure out what to do do i do treatment what do i do holistic natural like how do i take care of myself right and um so i'm doing the work it was like in october it was the month of october and i'm doing the practice i'm doing my video and i and it i'm like i said to him i need to go to training i need to go teach this i need to learn how to teach this for my clients and for people this needs to this is like the most powerful practice i've ever done it needs to spread like wildfire. It just needs, people need to know they can embrace all the parts of them. It just, it's fabulous. So training was November. So I said to my husband in October, I'm going to training. This is, we're in Michigan. It's in New York. It's nine hours away. We have four kids. He's like, and he's been, he's just like my soulmate. He's a wonderful man. He's like, whatever you got to do, whatever you got to do. And I'm, he's like, I know you make the right decisions. So I'm like, all right. So I went and wait, did he go? I think he went with me because that's okay. another thing. We love to travel. So he was probably like, whatever you got to do and I'm coming with you. So I think my mom watched the kids. We took off for the weekend and um, I was trained to teach it. And it was a powerful practice of just 
just really aligning yourself with your thoughts, your words, and your actions. And again, mindfulness is key, right? Mm -hmm. Tuning into our emotional state is key. How do we put it all into one and actually practice it? Mm -hmm. You know? And so that's what it's, that's like sort of how the, it kind of all came together because I knew again through my counseling and, and I went into the counseling program I went into at Oakland University because they had a complementary medicine and wellness program. So I was learning mindfulness through my master's degree, you know, so I was already in that, that, that field. And so the pieces just kept coming in. And when I found Intensati, it was like, ah, oh, oh. peace, you know, yoga was great. Yoga's wonderful. Yoga, I still teach yoga, but there was this other piece in Tensati where you can like start saying these words, telling yourself I'm strong enough. I'm worthy yeah. as we're practicing it, moving the body. Yeah. I had a student come to class one day and say, I don't have to go therapy anymore, Don. I'm just going to come to Intensati. I said, great. If that's what you do, great. If we can break through the blocks and break through the barriers and break through all that crap of wow. not enoughness. Yeah. This is where you can do it in a safe place, like a, a workout in a sense. Yeah. So that's, that's what it is. Oh, that, that's so, that's so interesting. And I find it so cool. Just out of curiosity, have you, are you into, have you heard of like the Avengers, the movie? Yeah. Like, so have you, you've seen, you know, Thanos, like that, that, that one villain with that gauntlet with the infinity stones. Yes. Yeah. So to give our listeners some reference, like Thanos, he's, they say he's a villain, but um, in, in reality, like his goal is for the greater good yep. and what he believes in. And he has this gauntlet that's designed to hold each different infinity stone. And there's six different infinity stones with different attributes, whatever. But from what it sounds like, it, would it be fair for me to say Intensati is essentially that gauntlet that holds all the all, all the pieces like you said together and brings it together it combines things together and that's when it you know it, it helps you take the action and actually it's the thing that moves progresses you forward while incorporating every single all those different factors then right that's how i see it that's why okay I love it. yes because like it can be taught, like I'll teach it as a class, right? A workout where you come in, you do the breath work, we meditate like in a yoga class and then we move and sweat our butts off. Yeah. And then we end with our intention or I've done it before too, which I love the most is like a, um, like a workshop. Okay. Like a two hour workshop when we're journaling and we're really tuning into our thoughts and we're breathing and we're feeling and we get up and then we move our body. It's all, it's all of it. It's all the stones to really put into practice how we want to live our life. Uh, that's, yeah. that's so awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and I mean, and, and like, and I say fun, but you know, I've done this work for a while. So like I can be in, in this class, like when I've taken the class, I've been in, the, like I've gone to New York several times and taken the class. And I, you know, you have kids, you have students in there, we're crying as we're moving because we're like releasing emotions. like. You know, and so it's not always easy, but it's like, ah, oh, like this is the work to get past the junk. Ah, okay. So out of curiosity, if our listeners want to find more about the Intensati method, mm -hmm. um, where would, the, would they go to? Like, where would they go? Would they go to your YouTube channel or do you have yeah. any? Oh, yeah. Yep. My YouTube channel is a great place to check it out because I have a lot of like quick little five minute Intensati blocks on there. So, okay. Someone's like, what the heck is she talking about? I want to see this in action. Yeah. Um, my YouTube channel, just Dawn Gaiden. If they search for me, they'll find my channel. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. Now we're about to wrap up the podcast here. And I got three more questions for you that I ask every single one of my guests. All right. Um, so first one, first question, I guess, is, is there one book or resource that you would recommend to our listeners that was most impactful specifically to you and your development and becoming who you are today? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I knew you were going to ask this and I thought I would be prepared. Um, so many wonderful authors. I'm going to say Gabrielle Bernstein. Okay. Spirit Junkie. Ooh. She Absolutely. taps into the spiritual side of us and just lays it out in a way that we can all understand it, where it's not so, like some people say woo-woo, it's not so, like it's so real. Okay. Well, that was one of my first, um, I shouldn't say first, it's just one in my collection I love. I went to see her speak um, in person. It was fantastic. Oh, that's, that's yeah. pretty awesome. 
Yeah. Okay, so I have Spirit Junkie by Gabriel Bernstein. Correct. Nice. I'm just writing this down for myself. <laughs> and second question I have is, um, e- even though like with our ep- with our recording right now, I feel like there's there's that common theme, um, but I, I think I'm, I have an inclination of what your answer may be for this question. So this question is, what do you think it takes to be first generation, or what does it mean to you? So. I define the term first generation a little bit more different from the dictionary. Uh, it's, it's less, I use the more metaphor, a more metaphorical approach and literal. So how I define first generation is someone is first generation uh, or first generation is uh, someone who has paved their, for their own path and definition of success on their own terms, no matter the negativity, hardships, um, obstacles that they have had to overcome, they could still continue to push through and in, in our world, I believe that many individuals have similar journeys, but no one walks the exact same path. Right. So that's how I define first generation now. So if I was to ask you, what do you believe it takes to be first generation? What would that be? Uh, I think it takes paying attention to what doesn't work. Okay. What's not okay for you. And then deciding to do what's right. Yeah. And being strong enough to make those decisions. Um, like for example, growing up, like growing up, one example, you know, my grandpa had a cottage. Girls did not drive the boats. Oh, girls okay. did, did not like that was not a girls don't drive the boats. Like we were limited based on being female. And again, I was the first one to go to college. So breaking that, that pattern. Right. But it was being aware of that. Like, Okay. Five boats, like, and questioning it. Like, I'm a big question. Question everything, and you don't have to be like defiant, but a investigative, mm-hmm. inquisitive. Question: Why don't girls drive boats? We both have hands. You know, we all know how to think. Yeah. We can drive cars. You know, so being able to did I question my grandpa? No, it was his boat. I'm not. But then, how do I go on with my life? When limits are placed on me and and, and is it okay mm-hmm. is it okay because maybe it's not you know and being able to then say oh no i can choose this path i can choose something else because that i don't think that's gonna work oh yeah that's that's wonderful dawn now last question i have for you then is where can we find you on social media where can we find more details about you and your work online yeah well, there's my email address, of course. Anyone can get in touch with me, dawn at createconsciousliving.com. Mm-hmm. And then I do have a free Facebook group. It's a private group, um, uh, Shift Your Image. It's about shifting that self-image to a more empowered, positive space. And so people are more than welcome to join that group. It gives You get a little taste um, of what I teach. I do intensati in that group. So people get a quick little mood boost each week of how to move the body and, and change our thoughts. Um, and then from there, they can always ask about my private coaching group mm-hmm. um, and gain information, of, of course, on that. But that that group would be a great way to say, like, peek in and okay. what it's really about. <laughs> awesome. And for our listeners, I'll be I'll be listing all of Dawn's uh, links and tags in this episode description below. So be sure to check those out. And Dawn, thank you so much for coming onto our show and sharing your story. Thank you. It was great. I love the information. The, the, it's just so fun to talk about things. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.